Hi there, and welcome to uh, Excellent Adventures Presents uh, Maximizing Your Kerbal. I'm Jimmy Williams. I'm a graduating senior in aerospace engineering here at Georgia Tech. Um, and I'm basically just going to run you through a bunch of math and concepts that will help you step up your game in Kerbal. Um, and I think a good place to start is basically at the start of your mission, which is launch. So we can begin with the idealized rocket equation, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Uh, and that is delta V is uh, the exit velocity of your gas times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass of your rocket. Now, shockingly, uh, Kerbal Space Program doesn't tell you the exit velocity of your rockets, but what it does tell you is the ISP. So this also has uh, this format, where the ISP is just um, the exit velocity divided by the reference acceleration of gravity. So for Earth, this is just 9.8 meters per second per second. And actually for Kerbin, it is as well, because the surface is you know, tweaked so that they've got the same gravity as us. So basically what this is telling you is uh, the higher your ISP, the better performance you can get. And also, the more fuel you burn, the higher your delta V is. Um, and there's a bunch of different ISPs for a bunch of different kinds of rocket technology. And I've just got a kind of list here. Um, SRBs, which are solid rocket boosters, um, have an ISP about like you know 200 to 280, um, and their exit velocity is about two kilometers per second. Uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, has an ISP of 450, which is you know times better than the SRB. So that's actually what uh, you know, manned missions in real life use almost all the time nowadays. Um, a nuclear engine has from 300 to 500 uh, ISP, and an ion engine has like thousands, tens of thousands, actually. Um, the trade-off for all of these is essentially thrust. So an SRB has this huge amount of thrust, but not a lot of ISP, whereas an ion engine probably has, you know, in real life, I think millinewtons, maybe up to a newton of thrust. Um, in Kerbal, this is upgraded a little bit just so you're not stuck tugging along the entire time. Um, so this is the idealized rocket equation. It's really good for in space, but you need to not be in space to get into space. So there's an addition to this, which is called the modified rocket equation which is essentially just minus delta V due to drag, uh, minus delta V due to gravity, and minus delta V due to gimbling. So, um, and again, I have numbers for real missions instead of Kerbal. Um, the delta V that you lose to drag is on the order of like 100 meters per second, so it's actually not that much. And gimbling is even not that much at you know, 70 or so. Uh, the gravity drag is actually pretty huge. Um, the total delta V for the idealized rocket equation to get into orbit uh, is about 8 kilometers a second. With the gravity drag included in that, it's 9 kilometers a second. So there's actually another kilometer per second of delta V that you have to have in your rocket in order to combat just the constant pull of gravity as you're going up. Um, which actually brings us pretty nicely into something called the gravity turn, which I'm sure everyone here uh, who has played Kerbal has performed a controlled version of this, which um, actually while I was researching for this talk, I realized that a pure gravity turn is completely uncommanded other than maintaining your angle of attack to the air, which is holy crap. So essentially, you've got your planet, and you're launching off here, 
you don't want to just go straight up and then straight sideways to do your burn. That's insane. What you want to do instead um, is burn uh, around. So you start straight up and then start turning over and over and over as you keep going. Um, ideally so that you are flat right when you hit your apoapsis, or sorry, periapsis um, of your eventual orbit. Now, this is really effective for super low Earth orbits, um, below, I think the number was 150 nautical miles uh, from the book I was referencing. Above that, you actually want to use a coast method. Um, so most of the time in Kerbal, a gravity turn, while you know it's, it's a good thing to do for super low orbits, most of the time you're having stuff that's out of the range of it, and you want to do instead a coast to orbit method, where essentially you've got your planet here, you've got a propulsive uh, trajectory, and this is the scale's crap on this. Um, you've got a propulsive trajectory, and then you start coasting once at you know this point, the rest of your orbit gets up to the desired altitude, and then once you are here, you start going again. Um, specifically in Kerbal, um, and this is kind of rule of thumb for me, um, just because optimizing your ascent profile is some work. Um, I like to essentially, as soon as I'm off the pad, go to about five degrees off of vertical until, say, uh, at about 20,000 meters, I try to be at 45, and then after 20,000 meters, just keep cranking up until you're about horizontal um, when you do have your, your coasting velocity set. Um, not a whole lot of numbers in gravity turns, just because not having numbers makes the analysis a lot harder. Um, getting a little further into uh, design of a rocket, there's a very important thing called, uh, well, just kind of payload fraction, mass fraction, all that kind of stuff, which is a, essentially a way for you to um, analyze how much stuff you can usefully get into orbit. So if we look at a, a single stage to orbit rocket, which is the simplest one to look at right now, um, the mass fraction is just MR equals MI over MF, which this is exactly what we saw in the rocket equation, where MI is MS plus MP plus MPL, where MS is structure, MP is propellant, and MPL is your payload, then MF is just everything minus the mass of the propellant, because you've already burned it up. Uh, there's a couple of uh, you know, different analysis methods, uh, or not analysis methods, but you know different types of fractions, the most important of which for this right now is the payload fraction, which is MPL over MI. So it's your payload versus everything. Um, usually for a rocket, your payload fraction is abysmal. 3% um, maybe of your total mass is your payload, because the rest of it's just fuel. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm not going to do that example. So then we come on to staging, which is a way for you to make your rocket hella more efficient, essentially, because now you're able to get rid of empty stuff. So if you have a two-stage rocket, so we've got something like this, where this is your payload, this is stage two, this is stage one, 
so the payload mass for stage one is just all of this. So this is MPL1, and then MPL2 is just the actual payload. Um, and this can extend to, you know, having paved stages. Uh, and I'm not going to do asparagus staging right now, which is probably what you do most of the time in Kerbal, just because the analysis for that is a little more tricky. Um, but essentially, the, the purpose of staging is such that uh, for, for a two-stage rocket, uh, we can find that, so the total delta V that you get from a rocket can be seen to be uh, g naught ISP1 times, I'm standing right in front of it, so I apologize. Uh, the first mass fraction plus uh, second mass fraction, and that's you know, another natural log in there, and so on and so forth for you know k many uh, stages that you have, so that for a, a two stage you've got your total uh, uh, delta v. Being G naught ISP one, assuming that both of the rockets you're using are the same, times the natural log of MSI plus MP one plus MS two plus MP two plus MPL all over MSI plus plus MP2 MPL and which it's kind of messy take my word for it it's it's more than just stage two um, so there's a way for you to determine uh, how much payload you can get to orbit through this um, and giving an example of the Zenith 2 rocket, which is another real-world one. All my, all my examples are real-world. Um, it's got two stages on it. Each one of them has similar ISPs, has similar uh, uh, you know, thrusts and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what you can do is essentially uh, make a chart of all of the different uh, delta V's and mass, payload masses that you want. And then in this example, we've got uh, 7,100 kilograms gives you delta V2 of 6,150, delta V1 5,960, delta V total of uh, about 10,000. And then there's a lot more numbers, and it gets down to uh, 13,910 gets you a delta V total of 920 meters per second, or 9,020 meters per second, which is orbital velocity on Earth. So, essentially, from this, you can tell that your biggest mass for the Zenith 2 rocket is about 13,000, about 14,000 kilograms, which is way more than if you just had the first stage. So next time you're designing in Kerbal, um, and I know this happens to me a lot because as much as I know about rocket scientists, or rocket science, I don't usually use it all in Kerbal, um, you can ensure that your rocket will get to orbit by giving yourself the rocket equation seeing how much fuel you need to get to orbit just with no payload, um, and then basically tweaking that, adding more and more and more payload until um, you don't have enough delta V anymore. Um, and orbital velocity on or around Kerbal at low Earth, low Kerbal, whatever, is about uh, two-something kilometers per second, and I think 
gravity drag adds another 500 meters per second to it. So as long as you've got you know three kilometers per second delta V, you're perfect. Um, so we're going to move on to some orbit stuff now, which I think is a little bit more interesting just because you're actually in space now. Um, so Kepler's three laws, um, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at a focus. The line joining a planet to the sun sweeps out an equal angle at an equal time. And the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. Um, these were Kepler's original findings. Um, these have then been generalized to some different things. Um, the first law is generalized to an, uh, an orbit being a, a conic section instead of an ellipse. So a conic section is just this um, with different slices through it. So a perfectly circular orbit is possible, which is just, oh god, terrible. Absolutely terrible. So you can think of it as just a straight cut. Um, an ellipse is an angled cut. A parabola is an angled cut that goes out still at an angle. And then a hyperbola is weird and it's on both sides. Um, now if you look at this, one of these orbits top down, and I'll use an ellipse because it's basically the you know, golden child of, of examples in all of this. You've got one focus here, which is your planet, and then you've got a couple of orbital parameters. Um, so the closest point to your planet is your periapsis, which is usually denoted as R sub P, and then you've got the furthest point which is R sub A. Um, and then there's a couple of different parameters. There's something here called the semi-lattice rectum, uh, not R, which is P. Um, and then uh, there's a midpoint here, you can imagine. And then the place between that and the midpoint is A, which is the semi-major axis. Um, usually you'll see 2a and 2p in any kind of calculations, just because that's a lot more important. Um, then you've got a concept of eccentricity, which is just e, where e, uh, or don't want to solve for e, but basically the uh, distance from a focal point to any point on an ellipse, uh, or parabola, or hyperbola, or circle is R times P over 1 plus E cos theta, where theta is this. Um, and this, if you ever look this up on a, a real lecture slide or something like that, this will be flipped. It's just because I'm, I'm left-handed. Um, so eccentricity is 0 for a circle. It's less than 1 for an ellipse. It's exactly 1 for a parabola and it's greater than one for hyperbola. Um, and I'm not going to draw all of those just because that eats up extra time. Uh, so once you are in your orbit, there's a few things that I want to introduce, uh, namely the concept of energy. So you've got a specific energy to your orbit, which is uh, written down on my last piece. So the energy is v squared over 2 minus mu over r. Mu is called the gravitational parameter. It is uh, the gravitational constant times the mass of the planet here around. So g times m equals mu. Um, and it's essentially just uh, a factor of how much is the planet pulling you. Um, the energy in an orbit is constant, which is great because now we can use this for a lot of things. Um, in addition, there is the um, angular momentum of your orbit, which is just h it is r cross v, uh, which is just like the, the 
definition of a uh, angular momentum. You can also think of it as R V cosine gamma, where gamma is your flight path angle, which is essentially um, how up or down your velocity is relative to the horizon. Okay. Um, wow. When I was preparing this, I like really liked defining things that don't matter. Uh, we've also got some kind of important uh, velocity that you can think of. Circular velocity, you can see, is square root of mu over the circular velocity. So in a circular orbit, the velocity doesn't change and the radius doesn't change, and they are both linked to this. Then uh, the escape velocity is 2 over square root of mu r. So uh, you can use this at any time to realize, or to see how much delta v you need to escape at that moment. Um, and escape velocity and your current radius um, are not bound by you know, being at the uh, periapsis of the apoapsis. So this actually works no matter where you are in your, in your orbit. Uh, okay. I don't really want to go over orbital elements because they also take a lot of time to look into. Um, but and any of the stuff that you're interested in after, you can, you can ask me and uh, I can try to explain it if we have time or I can definitely point you in the right direction. Uh, okay, so some more interesting stuff than just bland orbital definitions are actually using those definitions for doing stuff. So there are basically three different kinds of orbital maneuver. Um, everything breaks down into these three kinds. There's a uh, Hohmann transfer, there's an inclination change, and there's a combined Hohmann transfer and inclination change. Um, the Hohmann transfer should be generalized to just a uh, coplanar transfer, but whatever. So if you have a planet that you're orbiting, and you have an initial uh, an initial orbit, and you're trying to get to a different orbit, the most efficient way to do this is with something called the Hohmann transfer, which touches at two points on the orbits. Um, ideally, there would be circular orbits, but not everything is ideal, in which case you do get some less efficient uh, stuff. Um, so what you can do is, if you've got position one, position two, um, let's assume that these are both circular. Your velocity at position one is v1, which is vc1, which is v over r1. Now, the velocity you want to get to position 2 is just v2 equals vc2 equals so on and so forth. Um, what you need to do then is plan two burns at the two points. So vt1 then, which is your transfer speed from here to here, is uh, square root of 2 times mu over r1 plus the energy of your transfer orbit. And now the energy of your transfer orbit um, is again just uh, negative mu over v squared over 2 minus mu over r. But also what it is, is negative mu over 2 times the semi-major axis, like I said before. Um, and so 
in order to find the semi-major axis, what you can just do is say, uh, basically it's the distance between here and here, which is also your periapsis radius plus your apoapsis radius. So this is just uh, RP plus RA. It's just your uh, the uh, semi-major axis. So the energy of your transfer function or of your your transfer orbit is just the size of the two orbits essentially. So your first delta V is just uh, delta V1 is then V1 minus VT1. Um, and then once you're over here, it's just the same thing over again. So the, the delta V, Vt second, is just uh, the second velocity minus the second transfer velocity. So solve that how, however you want to, and then you know, you're good to go. Not every orbit is around the equator or the poles or you know whatever inclination you want it to be at. So sometimes you have to do a pure uh, a pure inclination change. So you can think about it as if you're around a planet with an equator and your first orbit is also around the equator and you want to go to a similar orbit that's just around a different point. Uh, you've got delta i here, which is just the change in inclination. So if we look at a vector diagram of uh, v1, v2, where the magnitudes of these are the same, uh, you have your delta i here, and this is just your delta v. You can do some quick trig to show that the sine of delta i over 2 equals delta v over 2 over v2 so that in order to get a pure inclination change with no change in your energy it's just 2v sine of delta i over 2 and what this actually tells you is that Anytime you want to do a plane change maneuver, you actually want to do it when your velocity is minimized. So you want to do it at your apoapsis, which is, uh, you know, hearkening back to the energy equation, your apoapsis is when your radius is maximized, so your velocity is minimized. Now, finding the angle between uh, your first velocity and your delta V is just a matter of realizing that these two corners are the same angle so that delta I plus what I've called 2 gamma is 180. So this boils down to gamma equaling uh, 90 minus delta I over 2 uh, in degrees and this is basically um, away from your retrograde vector, how many degrees you need to point yourself in order to perform this pure plane change maneuver. Um, and then moving forward to the third kind, which is just a combined maneuver um, in the interest of time and probably interest. I'm going to just breeze through this. Um, Using this same figure where delta or where v2 and v1 are not the same, you can just show that delta v is v1 squared plus v2 squared uh, plus 2v1 v2 cos delta i v1 half. Um, and then you can, you know. Keep, uh, keep that in your hat just in case you want to do both at once, um, which is more efficient, but does require a little better planning. Some of the sexiest stuff in orbital maneuvers 
is uh, catching and finding something, which uh, is what every space shuttle mission did. It's what every Mars mission does. Uh, it's what we did first with the Gemini missions back in the 60s. Um, super, super important, and it's super fucking hard. Uh, so there's there's two things called the Kepler problem and the Gauss problem, um, which are about orbital determination and estimation. Um, each of them could fill up you know, more than one lecture, so I'm not going to go over them too far. Um, basically, both of them rely on the period of your orbit, which is Kepler's third law, um, and in exact parameters, it's the period of your orbit is 2 pi of the square root of mu times a to the 3 half. So this is really, really good to tell you uh, how long until you're back at the same point, because that's just a full period. And it's actually also really easy to tell you a half period, because then you're just exactly opposite. And I think, actually, that only works going from a collapses uh, between periapsis and apolapsis. Um, any other change in your uh, uh, transit around the planet and everything goes to shit. Um, so Kepler's problem says, if I know uh, the orbit that I want to take, and I know the start and end point of my um, true anomaly, which, let me draw something real quick. So if you've got an orbit, there's um, a vector pointing through your periapsis, which is actually your uh, eccentricity vector. And then based off of this, and again, this is left-handed, um, there's an angle theta that signifies where your craft is along the orbit. So uh, some pretty smart folks determined uh, that it is possible to find out you know, the time of flight between this point and this point if you know uh, what this eccentricity vector is and the uh, semi-major axis here. Uh, or you can also back solve and say, if I want to be from here to here, uh, in, you know, some time of flight, what orbit do I need to take? So does it have to look like that? Does it have to look like that? Anything like that. Um, Gauss's problem is similar, which is basically saying, I want to be here, and I want to be here. Let me do that. Um, actually, yeah. So, so Gauss's problem is if you know the two positions, Kepler's problem is if you know the orbit and want to find the time. Um, so, like I said, these are super, super hard um, to solve. Uh, they, I, I actually have MATLAB code for each, and it took me a long time to do. Um, but what we do have is uh, online versions of these, essentially. So, there's two tools that are basically indispensable for planning interplanetary stuff. Uh, the first one is this uh, transfer window calculator, or, or transfer like optimizer, which essentially says, um, based on you know the most efficient path, um, what is the phase angle between you and the planet you want to get to? Um, so from this, you can see that if you want to go to Duna, the most effectively, you need to be about 45 degrees behind it, and you know your your ship has to be 150 degrees off of the orbital vector. But what's more effective is this one, um, which is a launch window planner. So there's something called a port job plot, which. Um, Basically, this is a very sparse version of it, which essentially says um, when do you want to depart, 
and how long do you want to get there? And then uh, it'll have a shape, something like this, where this shaded section is completely unfeasible because it takes way too much delta V. And then you've got some subsequent fork chop looking things here, which each of these circles, each of these you know, shapes corresponds to a different uh, um, required delta V to get where you want. And so that is reflected here where the optimum time to leave is uh, day 233. And this is you know, right after a fresh, fresh game start, um, where you can see that the travel time is not too much, but the uh, delta V required is minimized to about 1,600 meters per second. And you can see, um, just kind of like an interesting triviality, um, if you want to make your time of flight nothing, it takes basically an infinite amount of fuel. So. It's very important that you have these kinds of things. Um, and in fact, yeah, now that I zoomed out, I was able to find an even smaller amount of delta V. Uh, like in year four, I think now is year three. So you use that instead of making your own Kepler and Gauss solver, uh, because it takes a lot of work to do, and then even then, it's an iterative process um, instead of a closed form one. Uh, but once you've got your interplanetary trajectory all lined up, uh, you have to worry now about actually getting to your planet. Uh, and so here comes something called uh, the sphere of influence, which is essentially if you've got your planet there's basically an imaginary sphere around it where within this sphere, um, the planet you're around is acting on you. Outside of this sphere, uh, the sun is acting on you. Or, you know, say you've got the moon here, the moon's got its own little sphere of influence. Um, the reason for the sphere of influence uh, method, as opposed to something else, is uh, due to something called the n-body problem, where all of the math I just showed you only works if there are two things that are orbiting each other. Um, as soon as you involve a third thing, it's completely transcendental of a problem. You can't solve it closed form at all, um, and you have to use numerical methods to solve it, um, which for uh, you know, final design kind of stuff is definitely used, but if you're just trying to find the feasibility of getting to the moon, uh, using the sphere of influence kind of stuff is pretty darn good. The actual definition is a little bit arbitrary, um, just because it doesn't actually exist, but the radius of the sphere of influence is... the distance between the two bodies that you're caring about. So for the Earth, it's about 150 million kilometers. Um, and then the small and large mass divided um, raised to the two fifths. Uh, so you can tell that, you know, since the Earth is very small relative to the Sun, um, the sphere of influence is pretty darn close to it, which does make sense because you know, if you get uh, a few million miles away from the Earth, it's barely pulling on you relative to now that you're you know, just in solar orbit. So there are three basic stages to interplanetary travel. Um, there's your exit burn, your interplanetary coast, and your intro burn. Uh, you know, when you get into the new uh, sphere of influence of the new planet. Usually you do the second phase first, when you're just trying to find launch windows, and then you deal with the first and third uh, after that. So if you look at 
the first burn, uh, you've got some parking orbit here that you then blast out of. And so here's where your escape trajectory stuff comes into, comes into play, um, where you, know, you can tell the, the delta V required to get out. And then when you're coming back in, um, say you want to be in some specific orbit when you come all the way back in. Uh, if you track all the way out to the sphere of influence, you've got some V infinity. You will have an RP and a VP, which is just your periapsis radius and your periapsis velocity. And you've got something called the offset uh, distance, which is just a delta. And then recalling that the uh, angular momentum is uh, when you are at a periapsis, your, your uh, flight path angle is zero, so it's just the periapsis velocity and radius and times together. Um, and then also it is the infinity times delta. So you can tune this distance to get this distance and velocity to change. Um, you can tune this a little bit, but a lot less relative to uh, relative to the offset distance. Um, and then I think the last thing I'm going to talk about is something called a gravity assist, which if you get to work in Kerbal successfully, kudos to you, um, because it's another thing that takes a lot of iterative solutions to actually have be useful, um, but it's definitely uh, a good bragging rights kind of thing. So if you look at, uh, imagine we've got the sun here, we've got Mars here, and we've got your craft coming in to the planet. If we zoom in, uh, and then we consider it also that there's uh, all that Vm. So if Mars has its own velocity, when we zoom in on the sphere of influence, Mars still has some velocity. And now we've got some uh, incoming V infinity minus, uh, where V infinity minus is just your heliocentric velocity minus the velocity of Mars. So it's just V1 minus, uh, or, sorry, V infinity minus equals V1 minus, minus Vp. Yeah. Um, and then you will arc around the planet. And you can see, basically just from inspection, um, the velocities here and here are going to be the same according to Mars, because orbits don't change, orbits don't change their energy and you're at infinite distance both of these times. But your angle relative to the planet has changed. And so um, because this is a hyperbola, it gets some weird funky geometry that goes along with it. There's this delta, which is referred to as the turning angle. Um, and through some more funky geometry that doesn't really bear proving, we can see that the turning angle is related to the eccentricity of your orbit, which is also related to the, um, the speed that you're coming in at. So if you change this speed, you can change the turning angle and in turn change the angle of exit for yourself. And so if you actually want to use this, um, you can look at the entrance velocity, uh, where if we look at the infinity minus, and we look at the 
velocity of the planet and V1 minus. This then turns into at the exit. Uh, in this case, it's actually basically that plus that and then just completely overlaid. So um, Vm the infinity plus and V1 plus. So you've gained basically most of the velocity of the planet from just whipping around it. Um, and the reason for this is because within the frame of the planet, your velocity is the same, so your energy is the same. But since you're also leaving, um, you're actually stealing some energy from the planet to slingshot yourself further out. Um, as, a, as a corollary to this, if you want to greatly reduce your orbital energy, you can draw a new one. If your planet is coming in this way and you travel in front of it, you will essentially have given some energy to the planet um, and in turn slow yourself right the heck down. Uh, so that's essentially um, what I figured was a good jumping off point for making your uh, your Kerbal experience a little a little more scientific. Um, this is definitely, you know, me trying to get you to drink from a fire hose, and also me not being a professional lecturer. So I don't know how how effective all of this stuff was for actual Kerbal. Um, so I guess I'll open it up to questions right now. Um, if there's anything you guys want to know more about specifically, or anything that I was unclear about. No, nothing. What is the hardest mission you've flown? Um, the hardest mission I've flown, I once forgot to put RCS on, um, which is a reaction control system. It's like a, an orbital maneuvering thing. Mm -hmm. I forgot to put RCS on an Apollo-style lander. Um, so uh, an Apollo-style lander has an orbiter that returns you to Earth but also a separate lander that lands on the moon and then comes back to it. So I get probably a kilometer away from my orbiter and then realize uh, docking is going to be a lot harder than I thought originally because an RCS system has a bunch of thrusters arranged radially and axially so that you can move yourself up and down and left and right. Um, but I only had my big main motor, so I can only go forward and then turn myself. I go forward and turn myself. Um, and I managed to finally dock after like 20 minutes of firing and then backing up and firing and backing up and firing. Um, I got him home. <laughs> yeah. You know, Apollo 13, that's where it's <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there were sweating buckets in the... Uh, so yeah, in case there, unless there's a uh, anything else, I think I'm done. All right.